You know, when we think about the, the Christian life, right, when we think about our standard for, for living and the things that we are supposed to do as a people who not only know God, but understand that they are loved by God and are responding to God's love through their lives, I believe that the majority of people would agree with me when I, when I would say that we are called to be good people who do good works. Mind you, I'm not talking about what we must do in order to be saved, right? I'm thinking in regards to us already being saved and the life we are set out to live in response to the salvation that we have, that we already have in Jesus Christ. Right? I believe that we would all be in agreement that Christians, aka you and I, are to be loving people who practice good morals. Is anybody in disagreement with me? Okay, good. Then you would agree with me that, and then when I say that we are to, you know, do things like help the poor, we are to feed the hungry, we are to be a light into this world, and so forth. Right? There's no disagreement there, right? But where there might be a split in the road, where some of us might go left and some of us might go right, is where our hearts and motivation for doing the things that we do lies. Where you might go left and I might go right might be our intention and our reasoning behind why we would do the things that we are doing. And so, for example, for some people, their reasoning might their reasoning for uh, doing good works or wanting to be a good person or a better person, they might do that or their reasoning, their motivation behind that is because in doing these things, it makes them feel better about themselves. Right? Doing good works makes them feel better about themselves, especially in the presence of where things not so good about their life exist. Does it make sense? And so in, in other words, like we might do good works because in a sense or in a way it kind of covers up our, our bad works. Yeah? This, you guys with me on that? Like some people, they might do good works because it helps alleviate the guilt that exists in their own lives. And while that might be helpful, and while that might motivate an individual to do something when they would rather or they wouldn't do anything at all, one might argue that the heart behind it is more selfish than it is selfless. Some might argue that the intention behind it is more self-gratifying opposed to God-glorifying. You see, what I mean by that is they might only aspire to do good works when they feel as if they've done something wrong. So they're trying to, I guess, in a sense, you know, balance the scales. Some of us might do good works because we feel like as a Christian, I need to right my wrongs. Or I might do these things because it helps me feel, I don't know, a little bit relevant as a follower of Christ. You see, the, the other road is we might aspire to do good works. We might aspire to be good people. We might aspire to have good morals because it's coming from a place of gratitude. What I mean by that is that we, we might aspire to do good works because simply I am just thankful. I'm just thankful to be here. I'm just glad to be alive. I'm, I'm just blessed or whatever, whatever your reasoning might be, right? Their motivation behind what they do is simply driven by all that they have as a result of God's grace shown to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you, can, you, can you tell the difference between the two? Right? Once again, some people might go left and they might, this might be their motivation and others might go right because this is their reasoning and their motivation. You see, the things we do for God are either driven by our own intention or by the convictions God's love is having in our lives and the, the, and the glory we desire to give to Him. There is a distinct difference. And the reason why we can say that is because think about what Jesus says to the Pharisees or, when, or think about what Jesus says in Matthew 15, and it's not up there, so don't go looking for it. When Jesus uses the Pharisees as an example, right? Jesus says what? That these people, they honor me with what? Their lips. But their hearts are far from me. 
And what makes that so important for us to understand in the midst of this conversation is that the Pharisees, what are they supposed to be? They are supposed to be the, the standard. Right? They're supposed to be the model citizen as to what it means to live a life according to God's standard. They're supposed to be our prime example of what it means to live a godly life. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't expose their actions. He exposes their hearts. And so what you have to realize about that statement that Jesus makes is that it is possible, it is completely possible to give off the perception that you are doing things for God. But ultimately, and it's a matter of where our hearts are, as we are doing these things that are truly important. You know, on social media, you, uh, one of the things that often gets likes and views and, and so forth are, are these videos of people who post these videos of them like this, and they're like, hey, the homeless guy, let me, let me, here's a dollar, right? But on social media, we have these videos of, of people helping people. And I'll be honest with you, some of them, they're, they're great, right? Some of them, they can be very, very inspirational, some of them do a lot of good for, for people that could really, really use the help. But some of these people, they do it not because their hearts are generous, not because their hearts are filled with gratitude. But some people, they might do it because it gets what? Views. And you know, you know what views do on social media? It brings the money. It brings that revenue. And so while they might be doing good works, their heart and intention, right? Not, not, I'm not saying all these people are like that, but some, they might do it because, you know what, it's going to, even though I give $100, the views that this video is going to generate is going to bring thousands of dollars, right? And it's not like they say, oh, well, I got $1,000 for this, so let me, let me get back to this person. They're like, yeah, I just, I just, I just profited some money. There, there, there are people who use their platform to help people all across the world. And, and the reality is, unless the, the, the true intention of their heart is exposed, we will never know. And we can make guesses, and that's fine, but that's not going to do us any good. But the reality for us is to, for us to continually check our heart, to check our intention, to evaluate why we are doing the things that we're doing. Are, are, we, are we doing these things because it's going to make me feel better about myself? That, that shouldn't be the primary. That can be a secondary benefit, right? Because in, in my glorifying God, in my seeking God, like, you can feel better about yourself. Like, those things happen. That's a trickle-down effect. But if my sole purpose, if my sole reasoning behind doing the things that I'm doing is because it makes me feel better about me, then we begin to miss the point. You see, this morning in our scripture, we have Paul who's writing this letter to Titus. And one of the things to take note of when going through the book of Titus is that Paul's intention with writing this letter to him, to Titus, isn't about sharing the gospel, but tends to of, well, often tends to be the case, right, with other letters that Paul writes to when he writes to the churches. Right? Oftentimes he's like, amen, the gospel, right? Don't forget the gospel. That's usually Paul's, Paul's intent. That's usually his focus. But when we look at the book of Titus, and we look at the emphasis of what Paul is trying to communicate, then what we see is the inseparable link between four things. Faith, practice, belief, and behavior. Notice how all four, notice how all four of these things are intertwined together. All right, first comes faith. Then in my faith, I begin to practice certain things. And then in my practicing certain things, it begins to solidify what? My belief. Right? My faith isn't wavering, but my, but my belief is growing. And as a result, as these things are happening, it should reveal itself in what? Our behavior. And so Paul uses this letter to Titus as a means of helping the church be built up as a result of the gospel. To be established and solidify, and to establish and solidify the church, and to ensure that the people of God accurately reflect the gospel in their own lives, within the church, and as they walk alongside one another, and as they conduct themselves in society. And so, Paul's worry isn't about them knowing the gospel, but Paul's concern is about what the gospel is doing in their life, and how it presents themselves amongst their peers 
and how it reveals itself as they are out in society. That sounds important, right? I, I would hope, I would imagine that for you, that as you hear that, faith, practice, belief, behavior, that those things would sound important. And the reason is, is because it is. It is, it is extremely important, right? Because the basis behind everything that you and I do is important. And it is something that must be continually rooted, not in myself, not in my self-ambitions or self-intentions, but it's something that should be continually rooted in Christ, in Christ alone. And so our goal this morning is to gain a better understanding of what it means to have a sound doctrine, and how that plays a part into the people that we are becoming daily as a result of not our good intentions or our good works, but simply because of the justification and the sanctification that we have in and through Jesus Christ. Amen? So there's three things, three things to think about using our scripture this morning as we are aspiring to become sound, godly people. The first thing is this. Sound doctrine is the foundation for godly people. Right? Sound doctrine is the foundation for godly people. In verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul writes, he says this, he says, But as for you, as he's talking to Titus, and we can make the application that he can, he's talking to us or talking to people who would be in a position to lead, to teach, or set an example. He says what? Teach what accords with what? Say it with me, sound doctrine. In other words, what Paul is saying is that everything you teach in regards to the building up of believers and the building up of the church needs to be based off of what? Sound doctrine. Our teaching and even our example needs to be aligned with God's way and God's standard, not our own, not society's. Not the trends, but it has to be aligned with sound doctrine. Why? Because sound doctrine serves as a foundation for what? Godly people. I would imagine that you would identify yourself as a what? Godly person. You might say, I'm not the godliest of people, but I aspire to be a godly person. Yes? So this is important for us. Right? Sound doctrine serves as a foundation for godly people and for Christ-like behavior, demeanor, and even character. It serves as our reasoning as to why. It serves as our motivation for doing things a particular way. Sound doctrine serves as a direction for doing God's things God's way, opposed to doing it our own way or someone else's way. It's what we build up on top of as it pertains to our growth, our maturity, and so forth. Sound doctrine. It's important. But, but what is sound doctrine? Right? Like we, may, we, we might be like, yeah, 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 that sounds good. But, but, but what is that? So what is sound doctrine? Or why did Paul need to establish that fact that the things that we teach needs to be based off of sound doctrine. And the reason being is that during this time, as with our present day, notice that this is still relevant today, there are a lot of false teachers who are trying to manipulate the church. They were trying to manipulate believers in their favor to get them to do certain things for their benefit. Right? They were trying to alter the gospel and add all of these stipulations to it. Like, you can be saved by Christ, but then you got to do these things. Right? Or if you ever watch TV late at night, right, when you should be sleeping, or you fell asleep with the TV on, and you've ever woken up to an infomercial about how you can get this rag, right, that's from the robe of Jesus, right, recreated, and only for a, a simple fee of shipping, shipping and handling, that it can be sent to you and it can heal you, right? It's ironic that these things still exist today. But the point being is that during Titus' time, and even in our own society, right, we have people who are trying to manipulate the gospel for the personal gain. Right? Some people try to stand out, and in the midst of them standing out, lose focus of what the gospel. You see, what we have to understand about the gospel and the danger that is imposed on it 
as people tried to add their own opinion or try to better or up one each other in terms of understanding and so forth. But sound doctrine is the purity and the integrity of the gospel that is left untouched, unaltered. It can't be manipulated. Right? To, to use today's terms, it is the organic, non-GMO gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is that? What is, what, what is that based off of? What is the gospel? Where we are saved by what? By faith. We're not saved by works. And it is through God's grace alone that we have what? Salvation. And it is through the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, on his life, through his life, death, and even his resurrection that we will be what? Justified. As simple as that. That is salvation. And that is the basis for everything that we do. So if we're trying to piece these things together, then doctrine teaches us how to see God as the one from whom and through whom and to whom all things exist. Right? Doctrine directs our lives right, toward God and toward his glory. It's about having a right understanding of what God says in Scripture along with the proper exegesis of Scripture. You might be saying, exeg what? Exegesis. And exegesis is the understanding along with the application of Scripture. And so if this is the foundation for godly people living godly lives that reflect the love, grace, and mercy that we have received as a result of who Jesus is, then you can see the importance for us as believers to have a sound understanding of what? Sound doctrine. And I don't want, I don't want to like get sidetracked, but some of the stuff that some of you guys listen to at home as it pertains to sermons, they have no business being in your house. They sound good, doesn't mean it is good. We as followers of Christ really have to be careful about what we are, what we are hearing and what we are receiving as it pertains to teaching. That's what makes something like the prosperity gospel so dangerous. Because it speaks to our vulnerabilities. But we as the followers of Christ need to have sound doctrine. So how can we do that? How can we have sound doctrine? Or how can we have a stronger sound doctrine? If we look at what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, this is what he says. Right? Not to the church, but to another brother in Christ. He says, until I come. He says what? Say it with me. Devote. I'll say it again. Like, until I come, devote. Devote yourself to what? The public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Right? And obviously, during this time, they don't, have, they don't have Bibles in their homes. If you want to know more about God, if you want to gain a better understanding of the gospel, where did you have to go? You had to go to church. You had to go to those who knew it and that would speak the truth. Right? You had to gather when everyone else would gather to, to have Bible study or whatever the case might be. And so if sound doctrine is a foundation for godly people, then that means as believers, as followers of Christ, we need to not only establish that, but we also need to build on top of that. You see, Paul challenged Timothy right, to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. Right? Paul was encouraging Timothy to grow not away from the church, but to grow what? With the church. Yes, we need to grow outside of the church, but we need to bring to come together and collectively grow together. And it is sound doctrine that is strengthened and solidified through churches that have what? Sound doctrine. Just because a church is a church doesn't mean that they function as a church. Just because a church is a church doesn't mean that things that are being preached, the things that are being taught are reflective of the gospel. You've got to be careful. And I pray that through the tides of change that our church would remain a church that has sound doctrine as the foundation of all the things that it does. Because I like to believe that we have sound doctrine. But I would like to believe that we preach and teach and, and live life according to sound doctrine, to the foundation of the gospel. And if we don't, man, like you, we as a people, that if you recognize it, you got to speak up. You can't just exit the church and go, oh, man, they, they, they lost their way. No. In your conviction, you have to speak up. Moving on. Second thing is this, right? We can go all, on and on about sound doctrine. The second thing is this, is that godly living must first be embodied in our lives before it is passed down. And I apologize for the typo. There's still too many bees up there. It was my mistake. 
You see, it's one thing to have sound doctrine. It's one thing to have an understanding or even a grasp of these things. But it's one thing to know. It's one thing to know them, but it's a whole entire different thing to actually live them out. You see, in verses 2 to 3, Paul continues to address the issue by saying what? He says, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach to what they are to teach what is good. And so notice the qualities and the characteristics of both older men and women and what they are to embody. And I don't want to go into detail about what all these things are and how we might implement them into our lives or how, how we might do them better. The point is, we are to embody them. They are supposed to be a part of who we are. They are supposed to be a part of our identity as people who are saved and redeemed by Jesus Christ. And Paul will go on to say that you are to teach them. And the point isn't to, to pass them down. That's the goal. The eventual goal is to be able to pass them down. But the goal, the initial goal, leading up until that point, is to actually practice them and live them out. And so the goal for older men is to what? To be sober-minded and dignified. Like as a follower of Christ and as a seasoned Christian, right? because Paul specifically calls out the older men in age and in life, in, in life experiences. You are to be sober-minded, dignified, a.k.a. honorable and respectable. In other words, don't be that grumpy old man right, complaining about everything. Right, scripture calling you out today. Don't be that guy. Right, there's a lot to complain about, I know. But we can also be a person who offers solutions, not complaints. But there's also a call to be self-controlled and sound in what? Three things, faith, love, and steadfastness a.k.a. continually running this race until Christ calls you home. Now, older women, y'all ain't off the hook, right? Take notice of what you are called to embody, right? Paul challenges, challenges you to be what? Reverent in behavior. In other words, just in case that's hard to understand, that means that you've got to become holier, not crazier, you see, one thing I've noticed with women who are getting older is that they care less and have less patience. They say what's on their mind, right? And I don't know, they have this mindset that I just don't care anymore. And I don't know what it is as women get older, if the, the curlier their hair gets, the crazier they get, right? You know, so all the people with curly hair, they're looking around like, that's not me, Yobo, right? And your husband's going, that's you, Yobo, right? Right, Paul is saying that as we get older, the goal is to become more mature. The goal is to become more Christ-like in our demeanor. In his book called The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis tells the story of an old woman who meets her enemy on her way out of church. See, when her, when her enemy began to speak ill of her and to abuse her verbally, the old woman replied, isn't it a shame for you to be talking to me like that, you coward? Right, me in a state of grace. And I can't respond to you the way that I want to respond to you. And her response after that is, but you wait, because I won't be in a state of grace long. In other words, she was saying, you keep messing with me, you're going to find out. You mess around, you're going to find out. Right? That's essentially what she was saying. So ideally, age and growth in grace ought to coincide. The older we get, the more spiritually mature we should become. This is not always the case. Just as there are some temptations that are especially common to youth, age brings with it its own set of trials and tribulations. And in these verses, the Apostle Paul highlights some of these temptations and points to a more godly alternative, embodying these things. You see, I think that's a great way to see it. Godly alternatives in the presence of temptation. Why? Let's be honest. Because it can be easier to fight. It can be easier to give someone an earful. It's easier to tell them off. Right? It's easier to spread gossip when someone has already slandered your name. Right? Paul also mentions not to be uh, 
too dependent on wine, right? But we're not going to talk about that. That's another, another topic for another day. There's a lot to unpack here, right? We can be here forever. But ultimately, overall, the, the goal is to practice these things, right? The goal is to adapt them to our lives as we grow older and experience more life. Because here's the thing, right? As, as we are learning life lessons, as we are walking with Christ, right? As we are trying to mature, right? We are persevering, right? We're, 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 I would like to imagine we're taking the things that we experience in life and we're trying to learn from them, right? We're trying to be in a place where we can grow, mature, and eventually what? Pass them down. But in order to pass them down, you have to have them experienced in your life. This, this isn't one of those situations where you can fake it till you make it. This is one of those situations where you can feel the sincerity from life experiences and wanting to share those stories with the people, you know, beneath you or, or younger than you. In Ephesians chapter 4, this is what Paul writes. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. But the key thing that we need to worry about is, or remember is to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And we've been called forth by the gospel. You know, last night as I was distracted, right, a lot of things going on yesterday, a lot of football games, you know, distracted, all right? But one of the questions I came across when I was uh, scrolling through social media was this, when it caught, it caught me, and it said, what would you tell your 13-year-old self? Right now, and I understand that some of you in this room, that you're, you're, third, you're 40, 50, 60, 70. Some of you have been around since the B.C. era, right? But what would you tell your younger self? What would you tell your 13-year-old self? I would imagine that your response would, aside from, hey, invest in these stocks, right? Aside from that, right? I would imagine that the, the, the things that you would pass down would be based off of the things that you learned. It would be based off of the things that you wish you knew or the things that you wish you were a little bit more serious about in life. I looked at some of the comments on that video and some of them would be like, I would, I would, I would speak up so I wouldn't have to carry around this pain. Some of them said like, I would, I would tell people to know Jesus and to know him now, not later. Some of them said like, I, I, would, I would forgive more. Well, what would you tell your younger self? Your answers would be based off of the things that you have learned. And as it pertains to the things that what Paul is writing to Titus, I would imagine that the things that we would pass on or the things that we would want to pass down would be things that would be helpful and beneficial to those that we give them to because we have experienced it or we've learned from those mistakes and we have grown from it. You see, in verses 4 to 6, Paul then says this. He says, then train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. So here's the thing, church, like you, you can't lead others where you're not willing to go yourself. Or you can't take others to a place that you have not already been yourself. We we can't tell the younger generation, like, hey, practice self-control when we lack self-control. Right? Well, you can't tell someone to be submissive to the Lord, to follow his ways when you are blatantly rebellious in your own life. You see, one of the things that irks me is when people you look up to do certain things. And you know what they say to you? Don't be like me, kid. Right? You know, like, you know, like we'll use smoking as an example. Like, there's people who smoke, and they, what do they tell? Don't smoke. But I look up to you. Right? But I admire you. Yeah, but don't smoke. Right? Don't be like those people. Have a desire. Right? Have a desire to embody sound doctrine in your lives because you actually want to be a person who is able to lead others and encourage them to know Christ and to follow him. That's the goal. And I understand that we have things about our, our past we're not happy about. I know there's certain things about our lives that we would be we are embarrassed and ashamed of. And those things are okay. I'm not, we're not asking you to just empty the tank and just give it out to everybody. 
But I would imagine that in this life, especially as if we are considering ourselves to be people who are responding to the gospel, that wouldn't you want others to follow suit? And not to say, hey, look at me, but hey, look at to where I can take you with, toward Christ. That begins by embodying sound doctrine in our own lives. That begins by embodying these things that Scripture writes and wanting to genuinely live them out, not for our own sake, but for God's glory, that we can actually become an inspiration. Right? That's the goal. The goal isn't to grow old and, and walk away and, and, and live a quiet life. No, but the, the goal is that as you are embodying these things in your life, that you would see that you actually have value and worth, things that are worth passing down to a generation that is so lost. Because I know for a lot of you in this room, one of your biggest complaints about outside of this church is how lost this generation is. Is it not? But what have we done to speak truth? Into this generation, what we have, what have we done to be a loving example of the gospel to this generation we consider to be so lost? We complain more than we show compassion. There's something wrong there. The last thing is this: then, if, if we are taking all of these things into consideration, then we need to strive. Number three, strive to walk a life of faith that is worth passing down. Now, number two and number three, they're similar, but they're not the same. All right, number two is about embodying it first before wanting to pass it down. Number three is, is about becoming better, becoming consistent so that you can be someone others look to for an example and actually want to be like. Not, not in the sense that you want to receive the glory, but don't, wouldn't you want to be a living encouragement to somebody else that's trying to follow Christ? I, I I would, I would much rather that my life would lead people toward Christ, not away. Yes? Yes? You see, it's about making a committed effort to walk with Christ in your own life so that you actually have something to pass down to the next generation. In verses 7 to 8, right, we're going we're gonna to start landing this plan. I know it's getting long. In verse 7 to 8, it says, Sow yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and what? Sound speech that cannot be condemned. So that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. In other words, man, don't give your haters anything bad. Don't give them, don't give them the ammunition. Don't give them fuel to speak bad against you. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. Strive to be a person who, can, who, who people can look to. And I can go as far as saying, like, can we become a people that people can reference that in conversation, that as they're, as they're trying to understand what it means to, look, like, to be, live a godly life, to say, you know, man, you, sh you should be more like Elder Gary. I know, I know we're speaking, like, you know, farce here, right? It was a stretch. But I love Elder Gary, so we use him as an example. And you should be like Elder Gary. Man, you, you should strive to be like Pastor Terry. Man, you, you, man, you, you know, like this, there's, something about, there's something that Eric does, and you, you, you should try to, try to do that because it's worth copying. And we, we should strive to be a people who can be an example that people can bring up in conversation and reference and say, like, you should be like them. And they say, oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. Because the worst thing that can happen is that they should say, they should say hey, you should be like Pastor Frankie. Like, you crazy, man. I know that guy outside of church. You don't be like him. That's going to lead you down a dark path. Do, do you see? When, when they speak of you, what is, what is your reaction? When they speak of you, what is, what is the reputation? And my, my prayer is that your reputation is based off of what you have, uh, of the, based off of the way that you have presented yourself on a consistent basis, right? Because Paul says here, man, like, hey, make sure you're sound of speech. Man, man, make sure you're, you're a man of integrity. The things that you were teaching, like, don't, 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 Condescend yourself, right? Don't, don't indict yourself. Don't be, don't be a hypocrite. Charles Spurgeon gives us a little bit of insight into this. He says, he says Titus was, a, uh, was himself a young man. He must therefore be a pattern to young men. And as a pastor, evangelist, he must be a pattern to all sorts of men. In other words, an example. Because he's been there. 
Right? It is a pity when, the, when truth suffers at the hand of its own advocate. And perhaps the very worst, worst wounds that truth has received have been in the house of its friends. You must be careful, therefore, that he is of the contrary part may that, that he is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you in other words the thing that is most damaging to the church the thing that's most damaging to our reputation the most thing that is damaging to the credibility of our witness is the hypocrisy in our own actions See, the greater purpose behind what Paul is communicating is more than just a challenge and a call for us to grow and to become godly people. That is a part of it. But what you have to see is a bigger picture. When, when, you, when you think about your life, you have to envision the kingdom of God and the people that can be impacted simply by you just trying to live for Christ by you just trying to embody sound doctrine in your own life to be a godly person that is reflective of the very gospel that you are continually experiencing in your life, that when we think about this big picture, it is an opportunity to become a people, right? to become a people that would inspire and encourage the next generation to know God. The point is for you to embody this, the goal so you and I would, would encourage the next generation to know God, that they would seek him, that they would fear him. And I know what you're thinking, man, this generation, they don't fear God. And I said, you're probably right. But what have we contributed to their need or lack of need to fear God? The thing that has the greatest potential to rob the younger generation of that will be our inconsistencies in our character and the blatant hypocrisy opposed in our lives if we do not strive to walk a life of faith that is worth passing down. Two, scrap, two scriptures to wrap things up this morning. The first one comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example. You set the believers an example. You set the people who are on the brink of believing an example. How? In your speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and even in purity. The second one is this, Philippians 3.17. Paul writes this. He says, brothers, what does he say? Join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have on us. Imagine you're a, you're a younger person you read this. And you're like, I have no godly examples to follow. What a shame, right? Now imagine you're an older person who's reading this. And you're challenged. You say, you know what? I want to be a person that people can be look, that can look up to. I want to be a source of light. I want to be a source of guidance. Not that I would lead people to myself, but I know that in my own life that I'm walking toward Christ and that anybody that would lay eyes on me, that anybody that would be inspired by me, anybody that would be encouraged by me, that they could see me and I would have full peace in knowing that as I'm walking to Christ and if they were to follow me, we're going to the same place. Church, this morning we are being challenged by God's word, right? We are being stirred up by God's word to not only have a foundation of sound doctrine, but to strive. This ain't easy. Strive to be godly people who embody a sound doctrine, right? We are being reminded and encouraged to continually be a people who in their character, in their conduct, in their demeanor, reflect the gospel. So would you strive to grow? Would you strive to mature? Would you strive to practice these things in your life? And would you become a people who are worth looking to? Not that I'm saying that you're not already. But would you continually be a person worth looking to? And would you be a person that is worth inspiring the next generation to know God and to live for Him? Sound doctrine will raise up Sound, godly people. Amen.